God has certainly blessed us. Amen? I know I've asked you this question before, but I have to ask it again. How many are blessed beyond what you deserve? <laughs> you, you know what we deserve? I, I'm not even going to tell you what we deserve. Huh? To go where we don't want to go. That's what we deserve. But Jesus looked down at us and said, I love them. That's my child. That's my son. That's my daughter. And he has blessed us so tremendously. Amen? I want to talk to us about a subject that I feel the Lord directed me coming off of January of an awesome focus on prayer and fasting. I believe that that has and is propelling us forward. I want to talk to us about a subject I simply am calling below and beneath the surface. I've never seen an iceberg because I've never been where they are. But I've always been told that the part of the iceberg that you see above the water is so small in comparison to what's underneath the water. And if the pilot of that ship doesn't know what he's doing, he can actually rip a huge hole right in the bottom of the ship of what's underneath the surface. So when you think about below and beneath the surface, that can be the very different, that can be a very different sight and scene than what you see in the surface. When I look at you this morning, I see the surface. When you look at me up here, you see the surface. God knows what is beneath <laughs> the surface. God knows what is going on that no one else can see. No one else maybe knows. But you see, beneath, below and beneath the surface is also the very foundation of any structure. This beautiful sanctuary, this beautiful building that we enjoy time and time and time again for years, how many understand there is something below the surface? There is a foundation, there is a, a, a structure underneath we can't see it, but it's holding it all up. Also, below and beneath the surface, if you're taking notes, write this down, it is the root of any problem. It's the root. We can't just be concerned about what's above the surface, even though that brings concern, even though that needs attention, even though that helps us to understand but the root of the problem is beneath the surface. It's inside, and we can't see there. Jesus sees everything. Amen? How many are happy that Jesus sees everything about you? You really happy about that? Uh, uh, he sees everything. And you know what, church? That is a protection. The fact that He sees and knows everything is a wonderful protection. It's a safeguard. It is an accountability that we need to be thankful for. You see, the problems that we, say, that we face as a country and as a nation, in my opinion, is devastating. There are things happening that I've never seen happening to this degree in my lifetime. It's overwhelming, it's very complex, it's very complicated, the things that are going on now in our country, in our nation, and it's actually unbelievable. I would have never thought we would come to the place and dip to the, to the depths that we have gone to as a nation. I'm happy Jesus is on the throne. I'm happy that my trust is in Him. I'm happy that when things around me devastate me or they, they absolutely shock me, I'm happy to know that I can run to the Lord of which I put my faith and my trust and my confidence and He is my foundation that I'm standing on. Amen? So my first point this morning is how to deal with tragedy. How to deal with tragedy. You see, church, we can never understand grieving until we go through the valley of sorrow for ourselves. And I trust 
that we are grieving over the condition of our country. America needs Jesus like never before. Our leaders need Jesus desperately. Sometimes we think we are ready for a tragedy until a tragedy hits. And then we're so overwhelmed, we're so shocked. But you know what? If you're taking notes, write it down. We believe, well, what we believe determines how we grieve. You see, I can grieve over the condition of our country and our nation, but my grieving is different. I don't grieve without hope. Amen? I don't grieve like it's all gloom and doom and we're all just going to die one day because of some political leader's decision about all of us. No, no, no. I can grieve with hope and trust in Jesus Christ. So what we believe determines how we grieve. Under the pressure of need, we come where? To the throne of grace. I'm so happy that when the pressure of need rises up within me, I know where to run to. I know in whom I believe. Amen? I know who is concerned more about me and my situation and what I face and what I deal with than even me myself. And at those moments, we're very concerned. But Jesus is more concerned than we are. Write this down. In times of tragedy, we speak what we know. What do you mean, Pastor? In times of tragedy, we speak what we know. If we know the Word, guess what? We speak the Word. Out of us comes the hope. Out of us comes the trust. Out of us comes the promises of God. Why? We know the Word. So when tragedy hits our life, whether it's just a personal thing or it's a community thing or it's a whole nation thing, we speak what we know. So I encourage you to know the Word of God. Know the Word. If we rely on ourselves, church, we speak what we know, so then we speak defeat and we speak death. Why? Because we don't know the Word and we don't speak the Word. So you see why it's important? Get in the Word of God every day. Tell your friend right now, get in the Word. Get in the Word. Because when tragedy hits, and and church, it will hit. When tragedy hits, you will speak what you know. And I trust that we know the Word of God. Don't speak defeat and don't speak death. And let me tell you this, we can't hang out in darkness and expect to live in victory. Let me say that one more time. We cannot hang out in darkness and think we're going to live and expect to live in victory. You have to hang out in the light of Jesus Christ. That has to be who you are and how you operate and how you think and how you conduct your life and who you hang around. You cannot hang out in darkness. But when we call on the name of the Lord, (laughs) oh, how things change. How many can say, I'll testify of that, Pastor? When we call out on the name of the Lord, how things change. What happens? We find help for today. We find hope for tomorrow. And we find healing from yesterday. There may be several of you in this room today that need healing from what happened yesterday or the yesterdays in your life. Cry out to God and watch the healing come. If you have become hopeless because of all the things that we hear on the news and the media and the social media and all this thing, I mean, that could depress anyone. And if your hope has started to wane, as your hope has started to decrease, cry out to God and it will rise again within you. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I'm going to read from the Living Bible today. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Here's what it says. It is true that I am an ordinary, weak human being. Can anyone identify? But I don't use human plans and methods to win my battles. 
This is how I fight my battle. Amen? This is how I fight my battle. And this is what I say to the devil. Not today. Amen? And tomorrow I say, not today. This is how I fight my battles. I don't do it in human strength. I do it in the strength and the power of God. Let's read on. I use God's mighty weapons, not those made by men, to knock down the devil's strongholds. How many believe that that is possible? Let me ask the question again. I think more of you believe it than identify it. How many believe that is possible? Come on. You believe that? Then let's, let's act like we believe it. You know what? It's so easy. The American church, we can just be like, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I've heard it. Yeah, I've heard it. Yes, I know it. Yes, I've heard it. Yes, I've read it. And not really act on what we know to be true. It is true. These weapons, everybody say it with me, these weapons can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding him. I believe that with all of my heart. With these weapons, it says, I can capture rebels. How many used to be a rebel, huh? Yeah, many. I can capture rebels and bring them back to God and change them into men whose heart's desire is obedience to Christ. That's what these weapons do. We fight our battles with spiritual weapons because our battle is spiritual. Anytime someone fails God, it always, you can trace it back to the root part problem below, beneath the service surface. It is a sin problem. How many know that unbelief is a sin? The Bible is very strong about that. It is a sin problem. You see, we are not battling against flesh and blood, church, but against principalities. The Bible says, this is in Ephesians 6, 12, against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the high places. There is a spiritual world, and one is of God, and the other one is of the devil. And they're spirits, and they're both very strong. My second point is this, recognize the real enemy. Sometimes I think we've been fighting the wrong enemy. Sometimes I think we believe that this is the enemy or that's the enemy or that person's the enemy or so and so, but we have to be able to recognize the real enemy. We must go below and beneath the surface and see the real enemy. We must go to the root of the problem and not just battle the symptoms of the problem. We have to go deeper than that. The real problem is very simple. It's a five-letter word, devil. It's the enemy. He is the real problem. Our fight is against principalities. Now listen to me carefully because some of you maybe uh, understand this and some of you may hear this for the very first time, but I felt so strong in my spirit I had to bring us there today. You see, principalities that influence countries, influence regions within countries, influence states, influences cities, and even influences churches that fall into deception. That is by the spirit of the enemy. Those things don't just happen automatically. They've been, they've been discharged. They've been proclaimed. They've been sent forth to bring these things to pass. These are governmental spirits in the system of hell. They issue assignments and direct local warfare against the church. I'm going to tell you a story about this in a moment. They are the administrators of evil, these spirits that come from hell and from the, from the devil. Then, then, Pastor, how does the church win against such evil? I'm going to tell you how we win. Through spiritual authority that has been given to, to, to the church and the child of God by Jesus Christ in order to the principle of displacement. 
And I'm going to talk about, that's my third point, I'm going to talk about displacement. But we have been given spiritual authority and we need to take that ground that God has given us. We can't just lay down and roll over and say, oh, well, I guess the enemy's going to win. No, he was defeated. He was defeated 2,000 years ago. And we need to talk like, act like, speak like, and conduct ourselves like it's real. Because it is real, church. It's real. Help us, Jesus. You see, you don't cast out principalities because they don't dwell in people, but you displace them by His authority. My last point is this, the power of displacement. What is displacement? It, it means this, the moving of something from its place or its position. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8 and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Listen to what this says. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels going forth to battle with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But look what it says. But they were defeated. Somebody say amen. They were defeated. And look what it says. And there was no longer a place... Or another translation says, there was no longer room found for them in heaven any longer. They were displaced. They were removed. Notice it says, there was no room or no place for them in heaven. Why? Because they were displaced. You see, the place they once filled was now filled with Christ and His presence and His power. This warfare is going on in the world today to see who will control reality on the earth. Will it be heaven or will it be hell? And God has placed every one of us since we've been born again, He has placed us here to make sure that it is heaven and not hell. Heaven brings hope, amen? Heaven brings victory, not defeat, not death. You see, when we are dealing with the power of heaven and the power of hell, the battle is no longer physical. It is all spiritual. But it is the power of agreement, write it down, it's the power of agreement between man and God that helps us overcome what God says we can overcome. And we don't have to run in fear. We can know who lives within us. We can know who has control over everything. We can know the power of the church. And we can step forth in spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not just whispering a little prayer to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I just believe you'll take care of him. Nothing wrong with praying that sometimes. But let me tell you what, that is not spiritual warfare and that will not put the devil in his place. That will not drive the spirits away that are trying to take over you or your family or your business or your finances. Let me tell you what, you have to get aggressive. And the Bible says we can be aggressive with these things. In, first, in uh, Ephesians 1.10, it talks about the Father's plan is to bring all things together by Christ Jesus, things in heaven and things on the earth. And then if you go on to Ephesians 3.10, here's what it says. His intent was that now through the church, everybody say now through the church. And who is the church? It's you and it's me. Now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in high places. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you know you're a weapon against the enemy? Not you by yourself, but you with the Holy Spirit in you. You with the Word of God in you. You with the authority of God in you. You are a weapon against the enemy. But some of us act like we're the victim. It's time the church takes its place. Amen? It's time the church steps up and realizes who we are in Christ and what we can accomplish in His name. <coughs> Hallelujah. What am I saying? I'm saying this, as the church on earth agrees with the Father in heaven, the powers of darkness will be displaced. Listen to my story. Listen to this story. It's a true story. How many of you have ever heard of Dr. Cho in, in Seoul, South Korea? 
Dr. Cho, he pastors the largest Assembly of God church, well, the largest church in the world, not just Assemblies of God, the largest church in the world. He has somewhere between 800,000 and a million people that meet every Sunday. They have services from the break of day, one right after the other, right after the other, right after the other, so that they can get all these people in. Can you imagine? Well, listen, Dr. Cho is a prayer warrior. And Dr. Cho led that 800 to a million, 800,000 to a million people in spiritual warfare. And he has done so for years, for years and years. And he has taught them that they can take authority in the spirit. I think he has something like 200,000 deacons. Can you imagine that? What do you do with all those deacons? I mean, you put them to, you turn them loose and let them minister. Amen. But listen, he taught his church how to do spiritual warfare, and he has been known by this statement. The air, he's talking about the spiritual air, the air over Seoul, Korea is clean. What does he mean by that? They have displaced and driven out the evil spirits that wanted to take over that city. He truly, totally believes that. Several years ago, several American pastors were so, uh, so amazed that this man could build such, and that back in that time, it was probably only 700,000 people, you know. But they were so amazed that he had done such a tremendous work. And you know, Americans want to go find out, what, what were the steps? Tell me the five steps to victory. You know, that's Americans. And so they, they called up, they got in hold of him in his office and said, can we fly over and just meet with you and sit with you and just hear what you have to say of how you built such an amazing, awesome church? He said, come on over. He's about this big. He said, come on over. So they all got on the plane. I don't know how many, but several of them got on the plane, arrived. He greeted them with his friends, with his people in his church and and so they said, "Can we? where are we going to go to talk? He goes, oh, come with me, come with me. So he took them in the church, and he went to this room, and when he opened the door, it was a good-sized room, and there was, it was a carpeted room with not one piece of furniture in it. Empty room, carpeted room. So they thought, oh, I wonder, wonder what this is. So he said, look, I'd like all of you to just have a seat on the floor. So they did waiting to hear the steps. And he said, now we're going to pray for two or three hours. We're going to pray for two or three hours. So they began to cry out to God, and Dr. Cho led them, and, and they had this amazing, powerful uh, prayer meeting for about two or three hours, sitting on that carpet, laying on that carpet, their face in the carpet, crying out to God, and the presence of God came, and they were all so revived and so built up. And, and so when they got finished... He stood up, and he went around, he shook hands with them, and said, thank you for coming, thank you for coming. They were like, what? Thank you, I sure appreciate you coming. They said, but Dr. Cho, how did you build the church? He goes, this is how I built it. This is how I built it. In other words, what was he saying? This is how I fight my battles. This is how I build the church of Jesus Christ. This is how I displace the darkness that's trying to overtake my city. And he said, that's why it's clean air over Seoul, South Korea. Church, we have power. We have authority in the name of Jesus if we will just operate in the ways that God said to operate. Amen? Hallelujah. The church on earth must be aggressive in its agreement with the will of God. How many believe it's the will of God that we prosper and we reach everyone for Christ? How many believe it's the will of God that we drive back the forces of darkness and we displace them? And no, no, not today. No, not my house, not my family, not my church. No, no, not my city. I'm driving you back. I'm forcing you out of this area in the powerful name of Jesus. Church, it works. I'm telling you it works. This aggressive agreement ushers in the very presence of God and the influence of hell on earth is displaced. You know what we're saying when we do that? You can go back where you came from. Where's that? Hell. You can return to the pit from whence you came. You can return to that place where you fit. 
You don't fit in here. We have nothing to do with you. And me and my household, we're going to serve God. Hallelujah. And we're going to take aggressive steps towards driving the darkness away from Johnson City and the triple cities. In other words, go back to where you came. Then the will of God can be done on earth for our families, for our community, and for our church. That's what God wants us to do. But let, let me share with you just a little warning here. If the church is passive, and the church is indifferent, then the powers of hell increase on the earth and destruction of all kinds run rampant. Let me just give you a little example of what I'm talking about. Marriages will continue to fall apart and families will continue to be scattered. Crime will increase. Hatred will rule. Suicide will destroy and wickedness will reign. We cannot be passive, church. I felt so strong in my spirit coming off of January and all that we experienced and all the encouragement that came from the Lord and, and all of the victories that came. It's like, okay, now what? And now what is I'm going to walk in it and I'm going to live in it. And January may be gone, but February is here and March is coming and April will be here soon. And then it's May and we're going to live in this and walk in this and drive and displace the evil and the darkness away. Hallelujah. The church has been given an awesome responsibility of establishing the will of God on the earth. To establish it. He has, church, he has no other hands but yours and mine. He has no other mouthpiece but you and me. He has no other feet to go except us. Why do you think Jesus poured himself into the twelve? Why? Because he knew one day he was returning to heaven and they needed to carry out that which he had told. We will never solve the real problem if we don't first locate the real enemy. When the church cannot agree, and I'm talking about not just Calvary's love, I'm talking about the church. When the church cannot agree on its teachings and how and has so many conflicting doctrines. The enemy has God's people torn apart, operating in disunity and confused and running in different directions. That's what happens. Resulting in what? Resulting in losing sight of who and where the real enemy is. And then things like this start to happen. Christians attacking other Christians over trivial things that don't matter. Denomination against denomination, picking each other's doctrines apart, division over social issues and division over political issues and division over ethnic issues. Let me tell you something. That is not the enemy. We need to know who our enemy is and come against him with the Spirit of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the Word of God. We must take dead aim at the real enemy couple of questions I asked myself. Have we been battling in the wrong places? Have we been fighting the wrong enemy? Have our, in, have our ministries been superficial, ministering only to the symptoms? How many know you have to get to the root of the problem? You have to get below and beneath the surface. Otherwise, we're just struggling and wearing ourselves out with the symptoms, the symptoms, the symptoms, the symptoms. Amen? If it's drugs, we got to get to the bottom of it. If it's lying, if it's cheating, if it's stealing, if it's cheating on your spouse, we have to get to the bottom of the problem, to the root. Your problem and your battle, in case you were wondering, is not your spouse. Even though they may act like they are the problem sometimes. Maybe you may think they're the problem sometimes. It's not your children. It's not your boss. Your problem and your battle is not your government. It's not our country. It's not your church. It's not who's sitting in the White House. Church, 
Your warfare is against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where it is. That's where it is. We need to see with our spiritual eyes below and beneath the surface. The rebellious of this world need to surrender to Christ, but the only way they're ever going to surrender to Christ is that you and I tell them about the love of Christ. Let me give you just a little sneak preview of what's coming in May 2020. A little later, I'm going to have a couple of video clips I'm going to show you. We're going to go more in depth with this, but let me give you just a little sneak preview of what is coming in May of 2020. There is, a, there is an initiative called Go 2020. And the world, the, the religious, the Christian world is coming together. I, the, the, the latest number I just saw was a hundred or more denominations, groups, ministries that are buying into and they are coming together and we are going to unite for the month of May to reaching the loss. And it's called Go 2020. And can you imagine when all over the world, not just the assemblies of God, but churches all over the world are uniting together. It so touched my heart. I was like, yes, Lord, we've been divided long enough. Let us get focused on what really counts. And that's winning the loss to Jesus. Now, here's what they are believing God for. That, that 10 million Christians will win a hundred million souls. When, Pastor? During the month of May. Can you imagine that? We can win the world to Jesus if the church will unite together. Our district superintendent has given me the assignment. I am the coordinator of this whole movement in the Assemblies of God. We have about 350 churches in this state. And I am the coordinator to inspire and to encourage and to pull all of our churches together. And by the way, if you're a credential holder... If you're a credential holder with Assemblies of God, you're going to be receiving very soon an email from me and some video for you to take a look at. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do with Go 2020 in the month of May. I want you to be praying. Hallelujah. We can take territory. It's time that the churches and all different kinds of denominations are coming together. All of the evangelical churches are in on this. All the big names you can think of, they have bought into this, and we are going to do this in one month's time. Amen? Amen? Church, we live in the end times. We live in the last days. And if we're going to do something for God, we need to do it now. How many will pray with me? How many will pray with me? We've got, a, we've got a few months before May gets here, but we need to bathe this thing in prayer. And I'll be bringing more to you soon in the near future, and we can really get focused and go after this. You see, church, we cannot be ruled by what we see on the surface. We must look below and beneath the surface and operate in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me, please? What an assignment. What an assignment. When the superintendent called me and asked me, he said, Jerry, would you, would you be the coordinator? Would you head this whole thing up? The first thing I thought was, oh, Jesus, help me. Help me. But we've already rattled, rallied all of our presbyters. We met in January for our January meeting, and there's 20-some of us in all of them have already been rallied and behind this whole thing. And in this coming week, my email with some video clips is going to every credential holder with the Assemblies of God. And we have about 800 credential holders just in New York. So church, how do you, how do you climb a mountain one step at a time? How do we win 100 million souls one soul at a time? God is going to rally all of us. And guess what? Calvary's love is going to be heavily involved in this in the month of May. Pastor, can you translate that? Yes. You are going to be heavily involved in the month of May. 
That's how it translates. We're going to all get on board. How many know that all of us can do something? All of us can do something. How many have a family member or a close friend that does not know Jesus and you want to see them saved? Amen? You Okay, right there. Right there is your assignment. Right there is your assignment. I want you to just lay hands on someone's shoulder next to you. And I want us to pray for each other that we will enter into and be aggressive with spiritual warfare. What in the world is that, Pastor? It's declaring what the Word of God says is true. It's praying and believing it's going to happen. It's coming against the powers of darkness and the evil forces and those spirits that want to take over your household and this community and this church. But it's not going to happen. How many will say with me, not today? Hallelujah. And tomorrow we'll say it again in the spirit. Not today. Hallelujah. Why? Because this is how we fight our battles. Come on. Begin to pray with each other right now that God will help us to be aggressive, aggressive, and we can displace those spirits that are trying to, is bringing havoc on everyone and everything that's taking our nation and our country down the drain. We can stand up and say, enough is enough, and I'm tired of it. And the Word of God says, I can displace those spirits in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God, we thank you this morning. Hallelujah, lift your voices loud and clear together. Amen. God, help us. Help us to do what you've called us to do. Help us to be who you've called us to be. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to take the territory and the ground that you said we can take. Father, we have to walk in it. We have to live in it. We have to speak it. We have to pray it. We have to think about it, God. We have to move on it in the name of Jesus. Every day of our life, God, we have purpose. You have a plan for us, God. The church cannot lay down and be weak. It's time we take our place. It's time we step forward. It's time we advance in our relationship with you. It's time that our prayer life goes to a whole new level. It'll go to a whole new level and these spirits will be driving driven out and driven back. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you today for the power of your word, the truth of your word. I thank you today, Jesus, that you are alive and well among us. Now I want you to slip up your hand and say, thank you, Lord, for using me. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for using me. Thank you, God, for using me. I'm going to have a part in this, God. I'm going to have a part in winning a hundred million souls to Jesus during the month of May. Hallelujah. God, you had a plan. And Lord, you're initiating the plan. And we're going to see the results of it, God. Lord, I pray that you will rally 10 million Christians around the world today to reach a hundred million. Lord, we believe you for it and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. We hope this message has given you the evidence to see how God is already working in your life. He has more for you. Keep moving forward. And thank you for giving. It's because of you that we're able to reach more people. To give, you can go to calvaryslove.org slash give. You can download our Calvary's Love Church app, or you can text the word give and the amount to the number 607-228-8868. And hey, don't forget to share this message with someone you know.